Okay, get going. Okay, good evening. Um, I am Ben Hornstein, the general manager of Marin Water. Thanks to everyone who has joined in. What we want to do for the next couple hours is do our best to answer all of your questions. We do have um, a second webinar scheduled. Um, our thinking is at this one, we were going to initially today share a few things. We are going to have a lot of time to answer all your questions. First, we were going to give a brief overview of where we are in our water supply. And then we are planning to, um, we'll take questions on that. And then we were gonna move to conservation and demand management, um, what we're doing and where we're headed in terms of conservation activities, demand management, spend some time and explain some of the details of the actions that we've taken so far and then answer questions on that. The next webinar, we plan to do a um, deep dive into our supplemental supply efforts, talking about the inner tie, desal, and all of the questions associated with that. So that's the design of this um, with and this is being set up um, given our understanding that there's still a fair amount of questions that are out there and to give our community, our rate base, the opportunity you know, without the hard constraints that come with a formal board meeting to engage and to respond to really any and all questions you may have. Ideally, today focused on water supply and conservation. In the next webinar, I believe is in a couple of weeks, we focus on our supplemental supply projects. So with that, I'll turn it over. I believe Lucy Croy, are you gonna be giving the first brief presentation? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm Lucy Croy, the water quality manager, and I'm gonna bring up my screen to show a presentation for tonight. Okay, so tonight um, we're gonna be going through a discussion on the drought, um, covering a variety of topics as Ben mentioned. Um, first up, I'm gonna go through an update and an overview of our water supply, um, given the current drought conditions. And then I'm going to hand it off to Carrie Pollard, our water efficiency manager, who's going to give an overview of conservation tips as well as um, an overview of the incentives and re resources that Marin Water has available for our customers. And then we'll end with an open um, Q&A time at the end. Um, so, so that's when we'll open it up for questions. So starting off with um, an overview of water supply, 75% um, of our water comes from the, the watersheds that are just in our, in our backyard. So um, from the Mount Tam watershed, as well as from the West Marin watersheds. Um, and over the last two years, we've had historically dry years um, affecting the, the, the rainfall and the runoff that has gone into those reservoirs. So currently we have um, just below 34% of our total reservoir storage capacity. Um, and typically for this, this time of year, we would expect to see closer to 70% of, of storage. So about half of what we typically see um, at the beginning of October. So, so quite a difference from, from where we typically are. So over the last 12 months, um, we've really experienced historic drought um, conditions. The water year is really um, a year that it starts in October and goes through September, and this really defines the hydrologic period um, across, the, across the, um, the world. And so looking at water year 2021, which just ended at the end of September, um, across the state, the total rainfall was, was the second driest um, since 1895. So, so really historically dry, dry um, a dry period. Um, and this was also in tandem with it being a very warm period as well. So very little runoff that, that came um, through the state. 
Um, and as you can see on this map over here to the right, um, Northern California was hit particularly hard. Um, and interestingly, this water year was actually more severe than the 1976-77 water year that, that some remember as being very, very severe. When we look at our local um, historical record, we, we see the same statistics. So, so water year 2021 um, was the second driest in, in our 143 years of, of history. So looking back from 1879, um, when we first started recording data at Lake Lagunitas up in the, the Mount Tam watershed, um, we see that just this past year, we're the second lowest. Um, the first lowest was actually in 1924, where it was just about two inches less, but pretty severe conditions. And that um, minimal of, of rainfall has, has really impacted, as I mentioned, our, our reservoir storage. So where we sit today is, is this little green um, dot over here. So um, just around 27,000 acre feet, just a little bit um, below that um, at the beginning of October, whereas um, this, this darker line shows our average. So our average, we would be, um, we would be much, we, we, we'd be much higher. And then in the 1976-77 drought, you can see that we were, we were also a little bit lower. So as I mentioned, um, the storage is, is very historic um, for the district as well. So um, over the past 40 years, looking at kind of going into October, how much storage we would, we would have, you can see that this is actually the lowest amount of storage. So that 34% um, of total capacity is the lowest in 40 years. And, and that's significant for us because after the 77 um, drought, we, we increased storage and we took on a few large water supply projects in order to increase our capacity. Um, and those, those helped us weather quite a few um, dry periods, but you can see that going into 2021, um, that's left us in, in, a, in a different situation. Lucy, are, are we gonna talk more about what we've done since the 70s on your slides? If not, I'd like to uh, jump into that a little bit. Can I do that? Yeah, I think this would be a great place for that. Great, so um, I, I've seen, and I understand, but I just did wanna clarify for folks, um, cause I've seen, well, you guys haven't done anything. So I, I just, and that, that's an understandable perception. It just, in this instance, isn't really the case. Um, following the drought of the late 70s, we developed a new reservoir that added to our capacity. We doubled the size of an existing reservoir, both collectively significantly increasing our storage capacity, really, um, maxing out the capability of how much can be stored on the mountain. And we are operating under an order that um, would be difficult to increase that if we found a way, which we haven't found. But nonetheless, new reservoir doubled the size of a existing reservoir. We embarked on an aggressive uh, recycling program that we continue to expand, taking wastewater, um, with partnering with um, a wastewater district, Las Galinas, and we recently actually worked with them to increase their capacity, and we currently have some designs on their way to further expand our wastewater recycling program to use that water for irrigation. We also, um, since the 70s, tied into the Sonoma system, where we get 25% of our water supply and have some capability to get more under certain conditions. And then lastly, um, really a um, very robust and recognized conservation program we develop and continue to enhance. So I just wanted to share a tremendous amount of work effort and most importantly, facts on the ground that have greatly increased our water resilience that we have since the 70s. What you're hearing from Lucy, this natural disaster that's occurred the last two years and put us in this um, severe drought 
um, you know, that's really what we're trying to deal with and we will. And we're gonna talk today and next time about the specifics of what we're doing. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you, thank you, Ben. Um, and, and through this drought, we've really been maximizing all those local supplies. So, so reaching into all those reservoirs that we have um, and, and extending those supplies. So um, looking ahead through the, the upcoming months, we've, we've got a few projections um, looking to see, you know, given what the conditions, the, the rainfall could be over the next year, um, where, where would we end up? Um, and on the lower end, this, this orange dashed line showing um, 20, you know, if we were to end up with about 25% um, of normal rain, rainfall, and then on the upper end, showing average rainfall. So, so where we would end up with average rainfall. And what's significant here is also showing these solid lines. These solid lines above the blue and above the green are both showing the impact of conservation. So over the next year, um, for either the green or the blue line, showing that over that period, um, we can save around 10,000 acre feet if we're able to achieve the 40,000, the 40% the conservation savings that um, we've been messaging and talking to our customers about, customers about um, system-wide. So in the upcoming months, um, another note is that um, NOAA has put out a forecast of about a 70 to 80% of, of a weak to moderate La Nina. Um, right now, um, it, it's neutral in the equator, but they're forecasting that this will move more to a weaker moderate La Nina. And so what this typically means for Southern California and Nevada um, is more reliably dry conditions for that, that part of, of, the, um, of the states, so, so down here. But in Northern California, when, when we look back through, um, through the past, um, it, it's more equal chances between a wet and dry winter. So at this point, we really don't know what the forecast of a, lot, uh, a week to moderate La Nina means for us. It, it could mean either way. Um, so we'll continue to monitor it, monitor it and see, see where we end up. So then um, one, one more note on um, kind of the water savings and um, water use that we've seen over the past months. Um, looking back, we, we declared a water shortage emergency back in April and, and enacted mandatory water use restrictions. And we've been tracking water use over that period to watch it decline from our customers and see them respond, um, really, really respond out in the community. So over the summer period, we typically see uh, this orange line is our baseline. So seeing over the last three years, the average is that we see quite a spike. So we see irrigation peak during the summer and a lot more use. Um, and over this summer, we've seen it stay relatively steady and then start to decline a little bit more. Moving into October and November, we typically see um, the irrigation months kind of come to close. So um, water use kind of shifts to indoor use um, and it gets a little bit harder to get water savings, but we're hoping to see this, this, uh, this blue line continue to move towards the green, which is our targeted 40% reduction in water use. So at this point, I'm now going to hand it off to Carrie Pollard, our water efficiency manager, who's going to um, give an overview of our conservation program. Lucy, would it make sense to see if there's questions on the supply um, while it's fresh in people's minds before we move to conservation or? Uh... Yeah, yeah, I mean, can... I, I think we should get through the slides. That way we have a whole, we've, everything's been covered if we may, and we only have about 10 more slides and we have plenty of time okay. for all the Q&A. We can always go back and reference them, but that way we, okay. we've addressed it all up front. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, appreciate that. Um, so Carrie Pollard, Water Efficiency Manager. Um, so, so really what we're looking at is a community-wide call to action and, and each person and resident and water user within our community, whether they live here or they're a visitor they're a restaurant owner or they're a, you know, they just work in the community. They all have a role to play to really help us achieve this 40% reduction that, that we have, are calling for. We're gonna start with outdoor water use because that's really our biggest opportunity to save water. Um, even, even though it's October and, and the peak summer irrigation has passed, um, there still is irrigation that's occurring. Um, and when we have these warm, warm days, 
especially when it's windy, it drives out plants as well. We wanna recognize that um, the irrigation still is an opportunity to save a significant amount of water. So turning off your irrigation systems and watering all your plants by hand is, is a great place to start. You'd wanna focus any irrigation, that hand watering on your high value plants. So that would be your trees and your shrubs, recognizing that turf grass and lawns are um, the cheapest plant to replace. Um, and hopefully at some point, if you do let your, your, your um, lawn go, um, you'll consider installing water efficient landscaping when the drought's over. We don't want anyone to install new landscaping now because we just don't have the, uh, the water available for establishing those new plants, right? We're asking everyone to, to reduce their use and, and comply with our irrigation, um, assigned irrigation days. And so no new plantings at this time. Next slide. Um, another opportunity around around outdoor use is is leveraging and utilizing our recycled water fill station that's currently opened uh, across from the Civic Center. Um, any resident within the county can come by and pick up anywhere between five and three hundred gallons of water of recycled water to be taken and used at their at their site at their home. Um, it would be appropriate for all outdoor watering, cleaning of hardscapes. Um, if there are some limits. Of course, you don't want to drink it, you don't want to bathe in it, you don't want to cook with it. Um, and all of these details are covered um, when folks go to uh, the Civic Center or uh, on Armory to pick up their recycled water. So uh, it's another great opportunity if this idea of hand watering, um, you know, you want to go even further to reduce your outdoor use and leverage the recycled water for, um, for your plants. It'd be a great opportunity. Next slide. Looking indoor, we recognize that not everyone has a has a landscape, and perhaps you've taken um, all the actions we've already mentioned around um, reducing water use in your landscaping. So, installing a water efficient fixtures, so shower heads and faucet aerators, leak detection tablets, um, hose in nozzles, all of these items are available for free at the district. You can stop in and pick them up, and um, we also have buckets for capturing um, water while you're waiting for it to get hot, which is a great thing to do to take that water then outside to uh, put it on your trees. You'd be amazed how much water you're able to, to capture that, that method, using that method and um, to help give those, those, those very valuable, high value plants a little extra drink. We also have, um, we would love you to have you consider installing high efficiency, other high efficiency models. So clothes washers, toilets, dishwashers, et cetera. Um, and we have rebates to help and we'll go through those. I think it's important to remember that, um, you know, your the small the small actions you take, whether you're turning the water off when you brush your teeth, or you know, not flushing your toilet every time every time you use it, all of these small actions really do have significant impact on your water use, and it brings water awareness, um, and it really kind of creates a social norm around saving water, and uh, and and that's where we need everyone with our community to be at this time while we're. Um, but we have a call to action to reduce use. Next slide. Another, another tip would be to, you know, look at your data, look at how much water you're using. And there's really three ways to go about doing this. The first would be to use a Flume smart home water monitor. We do offer an incentive for installing these devices. And what it is, it's a very simple, easy to use device that attaches to your water meter. And then you get real time water use in five second intervals on your you know, smart device, whether it's your phone or your tablet or computer, whatever you prefer. And it allows you to understand how water is being used, whether it's indoor or outdoor, and, and also helps with leak notification. And so um, it's a great program. If you haven't heard about it, talk to your friends and neighbors. I'm sure one of them have. Um, there's been a lot of interest in that program. So that's, that's a great way. That's probably the simplest if you would. Another opportunity would be to read your water meter. Um, we have a link on our website that walks customers through how to read your water meter. And there's a, a, a very simple little um, calculator, if you would, a, 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 a template for you to um, write all the numbers down and how to locate them so that you can do the calculations to figure out how much water you're using within whatever particular time frame you'd like, whether it's um, you know, during that one irrigation cycle that you do each week or you know, um, you know, for one day's water use, it's a, it's a, it's a tool that's available at every customer's home um, for you to utilize. And finally, using your water bill on the if everyone pulls out their water bill after this, it would be great. Um, take a look at your water bill, and on the right hand side of your water bill, there's 
uh, generally a graph that shows your water use over the last year. And just above that, it shows the average gallons per day. And you could use that information to increase your understanding around month over month, which is a 60 day billing period, each billing period, how much water you're using um, and how that change throughout the changes throughout the year. We have provided guidance on how much residential indoor water use, um, you know, to give a range of how much indoor water use could be used per person for a most efficient household. And then also, you know, where there's more of an opportunity to reduce. So if you're down in the 35 gallons per person per day, and that's what that GPCD means is gallons per capita per day. So it's per person per day. If you're down in that range, um, you're doing great. And we wanna commend you. If you're at the 55 gallons per person range, then you know there's really probably more of an opportunity to, to, to reduce further. Again, this is indoor use and on your water bill, it's by service. We don't know how many folks live in your household. And so how many people live in your household? Um, so you would have to do that math based on pulling your water bill and taking a closer look at that. Next slide. We also want to um, just talk briefly about the recently adopted limits on water use for single family and dedicated irrigation meter customers. Um, these water use limits are associated with penalties that have been adopted. These penalties won't go into place and don't, they won't start until December 1st. And what that means is any water you use, you know, December 1st and after, um, we'll start showing, it'll show up on your February water bill. And so that's really where you're gonna see the penalties kick in um, and impact your, your bill. But what we're doing is we're calling, we wanna increase in our understanding of what these penalties look like and what the impacts could be in hopes to get our customers to respond now and not wait until December to start looking at their water use and looking at opportunities to save. Um, so any water use within tier one for single family customers would not incur a penalty and that's up to 21 CCFs and a CCF is 748 gallons, right? Um, and then tiers two, three, and four all would incur um, a penalty charge for each unit of water use, each CCF used. Next slide. Next slide, awesome, okay. And now, so um, we understand that's a lot, right? It's a little bit confusing looking at that, that graphic, although I hope hopefully it helps explain it a little bit. We also want to look at, you know, for a for a standard or a typical family, if you would, family of four, let's say the Jones family, there's four people in their household and, you know, they get their February bill and it's 38 CCFs. Um, and so that would mean that the first 21 CCFs are not penalized. And then the 17 CCFs that are in tier two would be um, have a penalty associated with that use. If the Jones family whoever they are, if they want to um, not have a penalty charge, then they would need to stay within that 21 CCFs, which is about 65 gallons per person per day. So if a family has less than four, that 65 actually slightly increases, right? They have a little bit more. Um, and if there's more than four people in the household, um, then you can actually get an adjustment. And um, staff is working hard on, on a, a letter and additional information to send out to all of our customers to increase the understanding um, with plenty of time prior to the December 1st date to ensure that um, you know, all of the questions can be answered up front so that customers understand opportunities to save, um, you know, especially if there's leaks, right? You wanna get those leaks fixed. Um, if there's opportunities to save, we wanna have them, them occurring prior to um, these penalties kicking in. There's also penalties with our, for our dedicated irrigation meter customers. Um, we didn't, we're not going into that here. Um, if, there, if you are a dedicated irrigation meter customer, feel free to reach out to us and we'd be happy to, to talk this through with you. It's kind of somewhat specific to, to businesses and you know, large, um, large parks and fields and such. Next slide. So let's talk about some rebates and incentives. Um, you know, we've, you know the, last, the last couple of slides are really the stick. We wanna also talk about the carrots because I think it's important that we recognize that the incentives are really can be what helps motivate our customers to take action. Um, and again, looking at irrigation, which is our, is, you know, turf grass specifically is our biggest opportunity. And so we're offering at $3 per square foot to remove your lawn and um, following the drought, when the drought is declared over, um, then to replant 
that that landscape with water efficient landscaping. Um, there's additional information on our website at marinwater.org slash rebates, um, but $3 a square foot is it's a, a robust incentive. And so we hope that, that folks will, will take advantage of that opportunity. Um, already, we've had many applicants come through the program. And so um, perhaps you know someone who's participated and they can, uh, can talk to you about it. Next slide. The, the flume rebate, I mentioned flume already, um, but we do offer um, an incentive where the water district will pay $115 for the installation of a flume device. You would need to purchase it through um, our website, which will link to flume, um, but it's a, so, so don't buy it on Amazon and we won't be able to cut you a check for the, the difference, but buy it through the, our website and, and it will only cost you $50. It's a great opportunity to have a better understanding of where you use your water and what opportunities you may have to save. For hot water recirculating systems is another rebate we offer. It's a $50 rebate. And what this does is it, it's a device that reduces the amount of time you have to wait for hot water to arrive at your, at your faucets. And so um, if you find that you're waiting um, and uh, if you're waiting long enough to where your bucket is overflowing before you can get that hot water, it's, a, it's something to consider installing a hot water recirculating system. Um, and uh, we will offer an incentive on that. Spool and spool, pool and spa cover rebates are also available for our customers within the service area at $100. All of this has, again, more information at our website, rainwater.org slash rebates. Next slide, thanks. Going deeper into these rebate programs, so we have a smart irrigation controller rebate. So these um, irrigation controllers uh, this is the first two bullets, the Ratio Irrigation Controller and the Water Sense Irrigation Controllers. Um, these are great um, long-term, right? So, so what they do is they self-adjust based on the weather. Well, sadly, as Lucy noted, it's been quite dry. And so most of these controllers would actually recommend um, irrigation beyond um, our watering restrictions. Um, but if you do install one, there's an opportunity for you to um, override that smart aspect of it. And then when the drought's over, um, you know, go back to, to utilizing it as a, as a tool in the long term um, because it will self-adjust and it, it takes the guesswork out of, um, you know, uh, how long you should be irrigating based on your plant material and types of irrigation systems. So, um, you know, we invite everyone to, to, to look at that. High efficiency clothes washers. Um, we offer a $100 rebate on uh, specific models of clothes washers, as well as toilets. Uh, the toilet rebate program has been has been brought back. And uh, so if you're in the market for a toilet, now would be a good opportunity to uh, install one. Uh, there are specific program requirements. And so take a look at those prior to purchasing a toilet. Next slide. Finally, I want to close out our incentive list with uh, what, what I refer to as drought proof supplies, right? So our laundry to landscape gray water rebate is a, it's a opportunity to install a gray water system that um, will capture water from your clothes washer and utilize it into your, in your landscaping. And so um, it's a, you know, you'll always have a, you'll always do laundry. Um, hopefully you're doing fewer loads these days, but you always do laundry. And so, you know, putting that water, using that water in your yard is a, is a great opportunity. Finally, rain barrels and cisterns. Um, we recognize it will, we will get some rain, whether or not it's going to be enough is, it's a big question. But if you have a rain barrel or a cistern on your property, you can capture that rain, um, that rain water and use it in your landscaping um, when we do have um, dry periods. We offer a 50 cent per gallon of storage up to $1,000 for rain barrels and cisterns. Excellent. In closing out, um, we offer a number of resources. We have one slide on resources, but our website is extensive as far as um, tools and tips and opportunities to, to learn more. So um, we wanna start with spreading the word. We, we find that, that most of our customers um, learn about programs word of mouth, right? So talking to your family and friends and neighbors, not only about conserving water, about the dry conditions and, and what you all can do to work together within the community to, to achieve um, the 40% savings that we're calling for and that we really need. Staying connected is going to be key. There's um, lots of information again at our website on uh, current programs, rebates, drought, water supply conditions, um, 
you know, all of our board packet materials, all of that is available on our website. So that's a great place to, to visit as well. And finally, reporting water waste. Um, you know, water waste would in, include uh, gutter flooding or leaks or um, customers irrigating on, on their not assigned irrigation day. Um, so all of that, we, we would accept those water waste reports and staff will follow up. Our intent with the water waste reporting is um, not to have it be heavy handed. We want it to be education. Most, most of our customers aren't interested in wasting water. They don't, they don't, they don't wanna be um, you know, those people, those water wasters. And so you know, the education is really where we start. And so um, if you, you're all, you all are eyes on the ground. So if you could help us um, in, increase the understanding around the, the, the restrictions we have in place, we would really appreciate it. So there's information there on water waste reporting. And with that, we wanna um, thank all of you for um, participating this evening. And we have um, an opportunity to answer any of your questions you might have. And now I'll turn it over to Emma Detweller, our acting communications manager for additional instructions. Um, I, I've been uh, texting, you know, a benefit you have of a virtual meeting with Emma. So what we were thinking is, um, that we would roll through the questions that have been written um, and then move to the hands. Specifically, initially, we want to focus on the questions that um, are asking about the information we present and meaning there are some desal questions. I anticipate we'll have time to get to those. But I do want to say that at the next webinar, we will be going into a deep dive into all things water um, supply in terms of the projects we've looked at, where we're headed and why, short term, long term. And I think really have a rich discussion that will further benefit um, and likely answer a lot of those questions. So just in order tonight, we're going to hit the conservation questions and related first, and then move to any other questions within the time we have. But we have a lot of time, right? We have still about 90 minutes. So if I could read these off, carry um, the conservation ones. Um, there's one, at, someone was asking that they're consuming less water now and they're at 21 CCS. You may have answered this, but just to respond directly, will they be penalized using that amount starting in December? They will not. Any customer, Ingles, any single family customer that uses less than 21 CCF within their billing period from December through May will not receive a penalty. Right, using 21 or less. Correct. So in this question, there'd be no penalties and um, I would strive to get a little tighter to make sure you don't inadvertently bump into tier two, but with the understanding, right, you're only penalized for that, in this case would be small amounts of water that got into tier two. Um, the next question was on, um, which is more efficient, if you happen to know, hand washing dishes in a sink basin or dishwasher? That's always a great question. So it depends on how old your dishwasher is and how you wash your dishes by hand. Um, so a older dishwasher is probably less efficient than um, a newer dishwasher, of course. But the most efficient way to wash dishes would be to use a bucket where you get hot soapy water and then you, you know, hand wash. You don't let the water just run while you do the dishes and then rinse them and move on, right? So. Um, if you if you are a hand washer that lets the water the faucet just run the entire time, then your dishwasher is probably a better a better option for you. No yeah. science, I mean, no studies there. Just you know, my flume device. <laughs> yeah, well, that that that's pretty good. Um, thank you. Um, there's a question once again. Poor people will be less likely to be able to pay penalties. I guess not a question, but it's a comment. Um, what we do have um, programs in place um, to address those that have affordability issues and we would work with them. Our efforts, of course, in terms of penalties is to get the word out. So this does not become a concern, but um, we will in all of our 
um, programs that we've put out that have penalties. We do have processes to review unique circumstances and cases, and that would um, certainly be in effect in this case. Um, then there's a question, does the grass rebate work if you put in hardscape like patios instead of plants, Carrie? Yeah, we do, you know, we, we do recognize that um, there, there, there may be some folks who don't want to just take out their entire lawn and then put plants back into that entire area. Um, we do ask that the area be permeable, right? So um, to minimize runoff and make sure that, that any, any, any water that does hit that surface can saturate into the, the ground. Um, but so yes, there are, there are opportunities to not just put plants back in um, and you can reach out to our staff um, to talk about what those, you know, what that might look like for your site, but absolutely. Okay. Um, there's a question, what is a flume? What does it look like? Yeah, so um, it's about the size of a cell phone, maybe a little bit thicker, and it straps onto your water meter. Um, and then that device pulls, reads the, the data. So it looks like, um, it just looks like a little box. It's not, it's not very big. Um, maybe two cell phones stacked. And then inside your home, it has a bridge, which is um, maybe a two by four inch little box that plugs into your power and it attaches or it connects to your Wi-Fi and it grabs the data from the meter, from the, the device that's strapped on your meter to the bridge. And then it sends it from the bridge to the cloud, which is how it acts, it gets it de delivered to your your cell phone or your electronic device. It's very simple. There's a number of videos online around how to install them and uh, take a look at their website for additional information. Yeah, I, I just wanted to reiterate what Carrie did share in her presentation on Flume, that many folks are reporting to us once they've installed it, it's a game changer because you're actually able to see how much you use. Um, we do have plans here to move to a system-wide um, AMI automa automated meter infrastructure system that would provide you with a similar tool um, that's probably um, three years out or so by the time it's fully um, designed and implemented and rolled out. And in the interim, these flume devices just really do seem to be very, very valuable. So I do encourage folks to look at those. Um, there's a question, is new pool construction allowed? Um, and for pool leaks that require draining and refilling, is that still allowed? So um, as of today, it is. Um, pools can be drained and refilled. Um, we are bringing an item to the board for um, their consideration on the 19th, which would um, not allow pools that are currently full to be drained um, during the drought and refilled with district water. Um, and then any pool that has a permit pulled after December 1st would, um, would not be allowed to be filled with district water as well. Um, but again, that's um, up for uh, board consideration on October 19th. But as of today, um, it is pool construction is allowed and pools can be filled. Okay, the, the last one, um, before we move to, uh, is a question just to explain, well, maybe there's more, non-permeable. Yeah, so non-permeable means um, that it can, uh, so concrete is, is non-permeable, right? Um, it means it hits, the, the water will hit it and run off. Um, permeable means it will soak in to the, to the ground. Okay, thank you. Um, can I calculate my GPCD, gallons per capita per day, or my gallons per person per day um, from my water bill? Absolutely, absolutely. So you're just gonna take your, your, your water bill and it says average gallons slash day, so average gallons per day, and you just take that number and divide it by the number of people in your household. And that will give you a, an indication. Um, there's additional information on our website. I do believe, and Emma would be able to tell us where that is, I, but there's additional information on our website around um, calculating that using your water bill. Um, there's a question regarding laundry to landscape, um, asking um, that they couldn't make our program work necessarily. They're looking at creating a do-it-yourself um, 
approach for pumping bath and sink water into a trough and then pumping that into the garden. And the question, is there any hazard storing gray water in open trough under a deck? Yes, there are. There's actually specific um, requirements around gray water system. They need to be they need to be covered, and the water needs to be used within 24 hours. These are not district rules; they're actually plumbing code requirements. Um, I would suggest you take a look at. Um, you know, we work closely with the Urban Farmer Store, and there's um, there's a couple of other um, local companies that really specialize in gray water and provide additional information. The Urban Farmer Store actually does our gray water webinars, which is why I refer to them. Um, but they would be able to provide some additional information and some guidance um, to help you help you design something that would make sense. Um, but I appreciate the creative way you're thinking about um, using that water and and uh, with you know setting it up correctly will be key to to ensuring that safety of, of all and that you have the water available for for use. Okay, um, the last one may be a softball for you. Um, this person has a smart meter. Should they think about also getting a flume? They should not. They should um, set up their their um, ion water account so that they can access their their water use. They don't need a flume device. Um, that same information will be provided to them. Uh, that's a, it's kind of a good point. We do have about 5,000 accounts within our service area that already have that, that AMI system that Ben mentioned that will be going district-wide in the next you know, three or so years. Um, so those, those handful of customers already have access to this detailed information. And, and if they need assistance, they can reach out to us. We'd be happy to walk them through how to um, sign up for that Ion Water account. Okay. Then there was a question, if one person is living in a single family home, um, are they allocated 65 gallons a day? You mentioned it might be more. Could you just explain that a little bit? Yeah, so it's tier one. It's really around tier one use. So tier one does not incur a penalty. So if you have um, you know, one person living in, in that household, um, you would have, you know, be, have access to up to 21 CCFs each 60 days. For um, before you 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 hit a penalty the penalty level, um, we hope if there's one person in your household and um, that that you're not anywhere near that 21 CCF right and and you could kind of challenge yourself to look at what is your water use and can you get you know where where do you where do you land in relation to the 65 gallons per person per day that we're we're um, we're recognizing that would would be the amount a family of four would have access to without penalty. Okay, the last question was is. Um, I think it's a bit unique for their circumstance and what their smart meter is telling them and they can't figure out this flow starts and stops. Um, the, um, it seems to me that it may be best for this person, I believe it's Tracy Pettis, to contact us separately and see if we may be able to, um, given maybe a more detailed discussion than we have time for, yeah. Um, I would I would just mention it's probably a valve. It's probably an irrigation valve that's leaking and then it fills and then it leaks and then it refills because two gallons of water an hour isn't it's not a toilet, which is your number one leaking fixture. Um, but but um, we'd be happy to to assist them. So uh, reach out to us, Tracy, and we'll we'll provide um, a bit more detail specific to you. Good. So maybe now we'll move to um, open questions. If there are any. Sure. So I'm Emma Detweiler. I'm the acting communications manager here at Marin Water and just wanted to thank you all again for attending this with us this evening. And we do have staff on hand to reply to these questions as you've seen. Um, ideally, if you could raise your hand using the raise hand button if you're on the computer or if you are joining us by phone to press star nine, that will raise your hand and then Terry Gillen our board secretary will call on you and you will be unmuted and able to ask your question. Um, to unmute, you can either press the unmute button on your computer or press star six on your phone. And staff will be looking at both the chat, the Q&A and taking those questions as well. So at this point, we will open it up and thanks again for joining us. And a reminder to folks, we really want to initially focus on questions related to supply and conservation that you heard from staff tonight. 
we hope to have time to get to, but we would want to reserve those for the end to uh, questions that aren't on that topic that we'll be hitting next time, the inner tie D cell and all the ideas which we benefit from greatly that folks may have. So with that, Terry. Sure. Um, I couldn't see. <laughs> all right, participants. First, let's start off with Nick Brubaker, then John Torrey. Mr. Brubaker? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, first off, I'll, I'll say that I use Flume and I am a <clears throat> huge proponent. Um, I, I moved to San Rafael in May and then when I installed my Flume, I found out that there was an irrigation leak that I didn't know, you know, like within a day it found out that I was leaking tons of water. So just wanna put that out there. I'm not paid by them. I just wanna say anyone who's, you know, um, <clears throat> considering getting a flume, do it, it's great. Uh, my, my question actually is around, so the recycled water program is really interesting to me. However, I don't have any means to transport water. And most of my water use, probably half, would be ideally for irrigation. So I'd love to use recycled water for irrigation. So is there any like plans to do some sort of water delivery service for irrigation purposes? If I'm willing to invest in a storage tank or something like, is that is that something the county is willing to consider? Paul, do you wanna take that? Sure, um, good evening, uh, Paul Sully, Operations Director. Thanks for the question, uh, Mr. Brubaker. Um, we have looked into deliveries of recycled water, and right now it just seems to be very difficult for us to find um, haulers that are willing to uh, take that on. Um, I think, and, and Lucy can correct me if I'm wrong, there is one hauler that's on our website um, that we, we did list, and he has a, a permit to, to pick up recycled water. So that, that may be an option for you. Is that right, Lucy? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. I mean, that, that just seems like something that is probably a, a bit of a challenge for most people who would be willing to use recycled water. So, um, you know, I'd love, I'd love to, you know, think about ways to incorporate that opportunity to maybe do deliveries in the future. Yeah, so I, mean, I would absolutely just in addition, I would just take the opportunity to point out that we do have a more traditional recycled water system that serves, you know, 330 services or so in the San Rafael and Terralinda area. And that that system takes about a million gallons a day of recycled water. So the, the residential pickup is not our only recycled water option if you happen to live in that area of San Rafael. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. John Torrey, please. Uh, yes, John Torrey here. Uh, I'm very pleased that the Water District is setting up these webinars. My questions uh, bear mainly on the intertie project and desalination, and I understand those will come up next time, and I'm hoping for a robust discussion of those two uh, water supply uh, possibilities. Uh, just by way of background, I was a, an environmental consultant to the Contra Costa Water District for eight years, working on their federal and state environmental documentation on their various projects. Also, uh, in the early 1980s, I was a senior project manager for Ralph M. Parsons on the Yanbu New City project on the Red Sea, about 300 kilometers north of Jeddah. And the uh, Parsons had the program management contract for the entire city, uh, the refinery, pipelines, projects, telecom, roadway construction, as well as water supply. And the water supply was provided entirely by uh, Mitsubishi with a barged in desalination plant. And also you should know that I uh, formed or helped form a 
a group on Nextdoor called the Marin Water Crisis Group. And we're all very interested in finding out how we can help the water district and what the water district is doing by way of ensuring uh, water supply, not just uh, through next summer, but in years beyond. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I do want to just um, touch on some of those comments. Um, we are um, conceptually um, very open to desal as a district. We've spent a tremendous amount of effort over the last 10 years and prior looking at desal. It's a proven technology, um, yet um, desal projects are um, often 10 years in the making. Um, maybe you could do it in five years. A good, well-designed, permitted through the entire stakeholder process and coming up with ways to deal with power, with brine, um, and we don't have that time. We do benefit from the work we've done in the past um, in terms of the technology, the water quality that would be produced um, and what we would do with the brine. Um, <clears throat> so we spent quite a lot of time that we'll get into at the next meeting on that. And where we are is it's a backup option due to um, two things, the um, limitations, the, the need and the time frame we would have to do it to benefit from um, these prefabbed units that are designed for emergencies like that, like this, yet there's limited numbers on the market. So we've done a very broad search and the indications are um, it would be a relative to the intertie project, um, notably less water and the cost, and the cost isn't a driver, but it's certainly a consideration would be in the 35, $40 million range for a temporary facility and the alternative project that we're looking at would cost considerably more, yet provide the potential for long-term benefits that would increase the resiliency of the agency and for our customers going into the future. So what we'll really dive deep into this and absolutely understand it's a lot of questions and concerns on that that I believe will be um, answered or at least good headway towards that at the next webinar. I have one more uh, hand raise. Christy Cohen. Um, I guess this is in relation to supply, although it also relates to the inner tie. Um, I'm just wondering how we could get water from areas that are suffering as much as we are. Uh, Lake Sonoma, Lake Mendocino, extremely, <clears throat> excuse me, extremely low. And uh, the other areas that would be considered are also in a deep drought. And I'm just wondering why this would be considered a practical, practical uh, alternative. Yeah, so again, we'll be getting into that in a lot of detail. I, I would say, the, the way I've come to understand and appreciate um, this is that um, we all know that the majority of the water in the state, I hear different numbers, 60% and higher, is used by agriculture. The approach that we're looking at is consistent with over 100 of these water transfers that are done annually, including many, many agencies um, looking and developing transfers um, today for this drought we're in. And the, the reason why it seems to hold together is that um, the 
farmers use the water for their business, right? It's an economic need, of course, to grow crops. And these trades allow them to consider, um, okay, for this year, do they want their water rights, their allotment to grow their crops? Or is the market <laughs> at a place where they make the economic decision to transfer their water that would be coming to them to grow their cotton or whatever it may be um, and sell that water and fallow their lands for that year. So it's really just transferring the use of water. It's not that there's no water in California, it's just strained. So the market um, the price of the water is going up that allows these farmers to make that economic decision this year. But we'll be going into many more details at the next webinar on that. But it's a good question, and we do understand the concerns around that. The next um, hand is Mr. Bob Smith. Mr. Smith? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, great. This is still on the topic of desal, and I just want to mention that, you know, I'm pretty familiar with the use of this equipment. Um, reverse osmosis has a lot of value, but in the case of taking salt out of seawater, remember you're taking a quarter pound of salt out of every gallon, and this is an incredibly high use of energy. The very same equipment that takes salt out of seawater can be used to purify wastewater. And there are several water districts in the state of California that are moving toward totally potable um, purified wastewater. Santa Clara Water District is the closest. Have you looked at this district and made contact with them? Um yeah, th this is a, a good question, and we are tracking what's going on in the state. Um, that concept for this drought is not in play, and that's largely due to, among other things, that the regulations that would allow um, DPR, direct potable reuse, to take wastewater through a reverse osmosis system that would um, ensure that it's a safe and reliable water supply and put that directly into our system or put it into our lakes. The regulations are under development. Um, Paul, do you know the date that the state is saying the regulations would come out? I think it's towards the end of 2023. Right, that's my understanding as well. So obviously that unfortunately does preclude this as being an opportunity in context of this drought, but we are monitoring um, that those processes in Santa Clara essentially is sort of moving forward at risk, but they're still in a phase where they'll be able to adapt to whatever regulations come out. Right. I'm very relieved that you're going with the pipeline because there are many reasons. There's a lot of public support for the idea of diesel, but people don't really understand it. And there's some reasons why it's not at all suitable for Marin County because we don't have an adequate location for the effluent. Um, and Santa Clara, definitely you can't drink this water now, but they are ahead of us and are making strides, as is pointed out here, to make the to modify the state regulations on drink of you know potability. So before we set up a desal system, if you want to put that much money into the hardware, I hope we'll look at these ideas of purification of the wastewater because you're just basically reusing MMWD water, and uh, you don't have to touch all the brine that's going to come out of that seawater. So I'll be looking forward to the next webinar and uh, participate in it then. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. I don't see any more hands raised. So I, I see in the chat, there's probably some questions that would benefit hitting. I could just roll through those. Um, 
the, maybe Emma, this one you could take. There's a question that people, um, not everyone has tuned in and got the message about conservation in accordance that we've been talking about at board meeting. Anyway, um, could you share um, what we've been doing to get this word out? Sure. So we have been on an aggressive outreach campaign um, since earlier this winter. Um, we have done a number of direct mailers to our customers' homes. We've also done mailers to the entire service area. So people that don't necessarily have a water bill but still live in the county um, rent per se and, and others like that, that we can also reach them. Um, we have a lot of robust information on our website, maroonwater.org slash conserve. We have um, all social media platforms. We're very active there. We have multiple posts a day on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We have a number of posts on Nextdoor. Our YouTube channel has all of our board meeting uh, videos up there. We also have our customer newsletter that's included in your bills. Um, we are hosting this webinar. We have another one on the 21st, actually coming up um, a bit sooner than we had previously mentioned, but we have staff available to take questions at any time. Um, we also have a dedicated line just for conservation consultations, really, where you can call and we can walk you through all these programs and find the best water saving um, programs and resources for you. So we've really been um, doing a lot of outreach around conservation and providing resources for our customers. I, I believe we have had over 60 different community presentations to date where we have given um, a similar presentation to this evening's and made staff available to various HOA groups, rotaries, city and town councils, neighborhood groups, you can request a, a presentation from us um, on our website. We'd be happy to come and speak to any of your neighborhood groups or, or other organizations. Um, we, we've really done our best to be available and provide the most up-to-date information to all of our customers. Okay, the, there's a question, Carrie, that maybe you can answer. Um, they stopped watering their lawn this year and plan to replace it with a deck and natives. Um, would this qualify for a rebate? Yes, they should reach out to us for uh, additional information on the program, the turf, the cash for grass rebate program. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm having some questions emailed over to me, um, a couple that have come through about the water use limits and penalties, just some clarification on the CCF calculation and, um, you know, really what that water use looks like and, and how the, the penalties will be um, brought to, to people's bills. Um, I don't know if we want to put that slide back up with the, maybe the example, our, our family example we could show um, how it's applied. That'd be great. I think it's specific to the CCF to gallons per day conversion that we have. Okay. So if we look at the bottom of this slide, 21 CCFs is, is the um, maximum amount of water that uh, a, a customer can use that would stay within tier one. So tier one is anywhere between zero and 21 CCFs. So one CCF is um, 748 gallons. So if you, maybe Lucy can circle there, seven, tw on the very bottom, 21 CCF equates to 15,708 gallons of water. So if they, if a, if, a, if a customer used 21 CCFs over one billing period, that would be 60 days. So you take that 15,000 gallons divided by 60, and then divide that by the number of people in your household to get 65 gallons per person per day. So say you used only um, 20 CCF, the gallons would be different, but the math would be the same. So that 21 would be 20 times 748 divided by 60, because we always have about 60 days in our billing period. And then you could change the number of people per household if you don't have four, say it's three, you can uh, do that calculation. So we do have a sample of this um, on our website. It's, it, it's under the how to read your water meter um, information. 
Um, and then I'll, uh, realizing that this can be confusing, staff is developing additional information that will be pushed out to, um, to our customers to help all of you understand and do this calculation on your own as well. So hopefully that helped. And if, if I didn't explain it well, maybe someone else can give it a try. <laughs> Thank you. I think there was a, a follow up to that, um, whether the allowance in tier one, is it limited only to indoor use or can I hand water my garden too? The, in, it's, it's, we, we, there's, we do no way we would know whether or not it's indoor or outdoor. We do have um, one day a week watering restrictions currently in place. Um, and so um, we, you know, we're asking all of our customers to cut back to the greatest extent possible recognizing that any water use within tier one will not um, have a penalty associated with it. And also further recognizing um, we're in a severe drought conditions and we ask everyone to do as much as they can to reduce demands. It looks like there's a question also about landscaping. Do you want me to address that one? Uh, new landscape. So depending on water supply, our landscape's going to be able to keep, our landscaper is going to be able to keep installing plants during this drought. Um, recognizing that there's a, an establishment phase where new plants do require additional water, even if they are low water use plants, which is um, an absolutely correct statement. Um, we are um, recommending deferral of new plantings at this time. Uh, there's no prohibition on installation of new plantings, but we are recommending a deferral um, to assist in, you know, achieving additional reductions and not having, um, you know, not installing plants that require additional water use at this time. So uh, hopefully that, that answers that question. And then are we going to implement, so are the cities and counties of Marin going to implement more stringent guidelines around plant watering requirements that are allowed in the landscape? Um, and they talk about locals and low and very low um, plants. Um, makes most sense in our changing climates. So um, Marin Water in our, in our district code does have a slightly more stringent um, planting requirements than the state. Um, and so um, I think we can, we can look at recognizing the conditions we're in those change, those, those um, have not changed, but I think it will be up for consideration as we move forward because you, and we do limit um, the amount of high water, use, high water plants that are installed in any new landscape within our service area. Um, and so all of that information is on our website as well around, uh, it's, we call that landscape plan review for anyone who's interested in digging into it a little deeper. And then counties organizing, is the county organizing any countywide comprehensive rain catchment system programs? Um, you know, there's been some movement with a number of, of cities within the county um, to implement a, kind of a local conservation program in response to the drought, which um, for example, Sustainable Fairfax has put together a proposal to, um, to have a, a local program and so um, I, there's, there's nothing really in place yet, um, but, but I think there is movement within the communities. And if there's interest there, there are a number of organizations, uh, I would say your sustainable, your sustainable Fairfax, sustainable San Rafael, et cetera, might be an opportunity to, to engage with them and, and uh, find out more about what they're doing as well. The, um, I, I do want to, um respond to a chat that I see, because this is a very important question. Is water quality being impacted because the reservoirs are so low? Um, the answer is no. Um, we're continuing to do um, the monitoring that we do routinely to ensure safe and reliable water and there's absolutely no impact to the water quality and we don't expect any impact. Um, however, um, there is the potential as the reservoirs get low um, that we have, um, we call it kind of taste and odor issues 
They don't affect the health of the water. Um, but at times we have, it, it's a natural phenomenon in lakes, you get some algae and certain types of algae, um, <coughs> excuse me, can release taste and odor compounds. So far we've done a pretty good job this summer staying ahead of that. What we do uh, ways to keep that growth down and we monitor it and take action. So bottom line, um, there's absolutely no health related issues. We don't expect any. If there is a algal bloom that causes a little taste and odor concern, we'll um, do our best to communicate that and deal with it. Um, but we will, um, you know, I just say overall, um, I'm confident with what we have in place in terms of all the work we have that we've talked about and you're gonna hear more about at the next webinar, that we will be doing what we've always done, um, including during this very difficult time period to provide our customers safe and reliable water. Um, we're asking you to use less in the time, of course, of this historic drought. And I, I do wanna say the numbers you saw um, don't reach that 40%, but we are ahead of the vast, vast majority of um, communities around the state in what we've been able to achieve so far. We aren't done and we need everyone to keep doing everything they can, but we have made with you great strides in terms of reducing the demand, which has put us in a um, far better position, certainly, than if you hadn't have, if our customers hadn't stepped up and reduced their demand. So I did want to thank you for your efforts, your continued efforts, and your support during this time period. We have any other, so we're, I think, running out of questions a bit. Um, interested if, um, I, I see we do have another one popping in. So we do have time. We're committed to be here till seven and answer every question. So even if that does mean if folks do have a question that's not exactly on the topic that we're trying to keep focused on, we're really doing this in an informal fashion to answer all the questions you may have. So we do have an opportunity to start deviating from the conservation topic if folks have questions. So I see Steve Isaac, sir, Terry. Yes, um, and also there are um, a couple of questions that came in through the Q&A too as well. So Mr. Steve Isaacs, go ahead, sir. Okay, uh, thank you for, uh, for hosting this. We very much appreciate it especially since the Giants game is uh, starting very, very quickly. No, no. There was a gentleman who was on earlier who talked uh, or made a comment regarding the Marin Water Crisis Group. Um, he, he said that it was on Nextdoor. I've just spent a moment or two trying to find it on Nextdoor. And I wonder if you could, uh, I, I I don't ask you to do it right now, but at some point, could someone um, locate that gentleman's name so that I could be in touch with him? Or if you're aware, Carrie, I saw you sh shaking or nodding your head. Um, are you aware of that uh, group? I did a quick search as well. Um, I'm not, but his name was Jim Tor John Torrey, T-O-R-R-E-Y. So. T-O-R-R-E-Y. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. There are no more hands raised. There's a question about vegetable gardens. Are we discouraging vegetable gardens? I just wanna, wanna just address that. Of course, of course not. Growing your own food is, is um, you know, key and very important to so many within our communities. Um, what we're really trying to do is get as much water savings as we possibly can. And so um, if there's a, 
a situation where um, someone's growing uh, vegetable gardens and it impacts their, um, their water use during those winter months to the point where um, they need a variance, there's a process in place and that information is available on our website. I, I just wanted to build on the last comment that um, there's a number of these kind of grassroots driven efforts that we are very appreciative of. And we, we do want to support in ways that make sense for whatever group it is. So th that would be an opportunity if there's a community group, you want um, a speaker to come to speak on a particular drought related topic, just let us know. Um, or if there's other support we can provide, providing the group as a whole with some of our conservation devices that we give out, whatever it may be, we're very interested because that's the power. And thank you for um, the question and for the gentleman who indicated the group he's formed and there's others, Baron Hamill is just really done outstanding work. I believe she's on the call. So we do want to do everything we can. So just let us know how to support these grassroots efforts that are emerging, because that's really right. The power is grassroots, but we, we want to be engaged to the extent, you know, it makes sense for the respective groups. I have two raised hands, uh, Nick Brubaker and Baron Hamill. Mr. Brubaker. Hi there. You know, I just really wanted to say thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, this has been super informative, and I really look forward to more forums like this. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Hamill. Hi, thank you. And Mr. Hornstein, thank you for the shout out. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, for the audience, so that I can get the word out. My website for the water issue is a drop in the bucket.org. There's a Facebook group, a drop in the bucket. There's a Facebook page, a drop in the bucket. There's also a Twitter account, a drop in the bucket. And I have a newsletter, a drop in the bucket. <laughs> so if anybody is interested in participating with me on that, website if you want access and receive the newsletter weekly. I send it out on Saturdays. Go to the website. There's a link in there that you can email me and you will be put on my mailing list. I do not share the mailing list with anybody else. So thank you again. I appreciate your support and I'm doing what I can to support you in all your hard work. Well, I, I would just say you absolutely are. And I, I would just note, um, you know, uh, among the two plus hundred emails I get every day, um, many of which, you know, I may not attend to, I do open up the newsletter when it comes from Barron and I do find it informative. So um, it's, it's really inspiring to see all the effort you and other members of the community are putting into this. So thank you again. Thank you. It's good to know that my work is not for naught, that it's not just being sent to the delete bucket. So thank you for participating in my a drop in the bucket. Thank you. Um, there are currently uh, no hands raised. <clears throat> There's a comment right. in the Q&A um, about We've been watering our trees at least minimally, but other plants are drying up and leaves are dry leaves are all around. Concerned that these leaves are a problem for spreading possible fire. And do we have any recommendations? And I think that this is fire. Fire is absolutely a concern with the dry conditions we are experiencing. Um, staff continues to work with Fire Safe Marin around um, recommendations. You know, they're really the, the experts, but um, they do have a number of resources on their website, Fire Safe Marin. Um, and I would, I would direct um, you all to look there. Uh, there's some, um, uh, not only resources, but you know, recommendations and um, uh, assistance that they're providing. So take a look there, Fire Safe Marin. Okay, are we at 
closing comments for me here? Well, um, assuming nothing else emerges, I just wanted to, again, thank everyone and just reinforce the notion and right, the challenges folks that made the effort to participate and attend here are probably already engaged in doing what you can, but right, it's really about leveraging your commitment to conserving water with your family members and neighbors and community groups and helping us spread the word, which I'm sure you're doing. And th this is really a case, you know, obviously I suppose, but to say it, that every drop really does matter. Because when you have 200,000 people approximately in our service area, it, it really does add up. Whether it's, you know, getting around for that old toilet that works fine, yet uses five gallons of water every flush or just the practices or um, you've been interested in the flume making, going ahead with that. Um, it really does all add up and contribute to um, where we land in terms of our overall resiliency and um, you know how impacted the community is gonna be as we get through this period. So, um, Thank you and continue all of your efforts. And um, we'll, um, in addition to the next one, I think based on the comments, we will think about maybe having these just routine on some frequency through the duration of the drought. So thank you so much for your time. Um, if there's no closing questions that you guys are seeing pop up, um, I guess we can conclude. I am seeing one, I think, I believe it's in reference to the weekly watering schedule email that went out, encouraging folks to turn off their irrigation systems. Yeah, I can address it where, um, is it in the Q&A or the chat, sorry? This is in the chat. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, this is in the Q&A. In the past week, the weekly watering 613. Watering. So um, the re so we have a weekly watering schedule that's sent out to a handful of customers who have signed up for it. And, and that weekly watering schedule has recommended to stop irrigation. Um, as noted in my presentation, it's really what we're calling on our asking customers to do is to stop irrigation if you can and spot water by hand. Um, and that's what that recommendation was around. The, um, the current restrictions are a one day a week for overhead spray and with assigned days and two days a week of drip are allowed. Um, but as we move into fall, um, the weather cools, is cooling down. Um, it's an opportunity to achieve additional water savings, which is why that recommendation was put out on our weekly watering schedule. Okay. I think, and I think that was it, I think, yes, like all of them. Very good, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you everyone.